What's up, STS Nation, and welcome to another episode of Surviving the Survivor, the podcast that promises to bring you the very best guests in all of true crime. And today, we are diving back in headfirst into the Dan Markell murder case. Of course, he is the Harvard, Harvard-educated FSU law professor gunned down in his Tallahassee driveway back in 2014. Two hitmen and a go-between already convicted of the crime, and they are doing their time in prison. Ex-brother-in-law Charlie Adelson sits in a Leon County jail in Tallahassee awaiting his murder trial. John Singer on the panel said it would be pushed back, that there would be a continuance. And he's a top lawyer for exactly that reason, because he was right. Uh, the trial date, it was supposed to be, I believe, in June, now set for a jury selection to begin October 23rd. Uh, the big question now is, could other Adelsons be indicted in the meantime? And one career military lawyer and legal mind believes that there are at least 125 reasons right now why Wendy Adelson, the ex-wife of Dan Markell, could be charged. Our best guests are here to break it all down. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel retired Carl Steinbeck coming to us from Texas. He is a nearly 30 year judge advocate for the U.S. Army Judge Advocate General Corps and Combat uh, Veteran. Uh, he now zealously represents military service members and Department of, Department of Defense civilian employees across the globe and fighting for their justice matters at the Steinbeck Law Firm. He hosts his own YouTube channel called jury trial mentor with his brother john steinbeck not the author of mice and men but uh nevertheless a great guy um we were supposed to have dave arenberg a florida state attorney out of palm beach county um he had a, a, a another obligation that came up but will join us next week he is he was a personal friend of dan's and uh, again he'll be on uh we have him scheduled for a week from today uh, to come back on and discuss this. Meanwhile, John Singer is the other face, the familiar one. He is the co-founder of Singer Deutsch LLP, a graduate of Georgetown Law. He's been designated a super lawyer for a thousand years in a row, and he makes regular appearances not only on STS, but on CNBC and tons of other media outlets. And we are waiting for Judy Tsang of Asian American legal focus she is supposed to join us and uh hopefully she will be here uh soon quick programming note follow us on fa facebook uh instagram twitter where i post times we are at podcast sts um a quick summary for those of you who haven't followed this case because i know a lot of you are coming over uh either from the Lori vallow daybell trial uh, and or Alec Murdoch or the Idaho Four. So Charlie Adelson is the accused ringleader in a 2014 murder for hire plot, uh, which was carried out of Florida State law professor Dan Markell. As I mentioned, two hitmen were tried and convicted along with a middle woman, not a middle man. Her, na her name is Katie Magbanawa. Um, It'll be more than nine years uh, since the Savage murder took place that Charlie will go on trial in the fall. He was arrested on a murder charge one year ago tomorrow. That was eight years uh, after the murder. So we're asking the question, will other members of the Adelson family be charged like Dan Markell's ex-wife, Wendy, or ex-mother-in-law, Donna? And uh, without further ado, we've gone through 40 of these points before, and uh, Carl Steinbeck, uh, a decorated attorney, a military attorney, is here. Uh, we've gone through 39 points, and uh, Carl, I believe we are starting with point number 40. And uh, as we go through these points, the baby doll, feel free to uh, send in questions and or comments for John and Carl and hopefully Judy Short. So, Carl, point number 40. Yes, sir. So Wendy, besides just changing the name of her boys from Markel and also one of the middle names of the boys that had a Markel connection, she changed that as well to strip them of any identity from being a Markel. What happened is when she went to court to actually do the filing, 
She even indicated that she was reverting their names back to their original names. So she didn't even check the right box to indicate that this was a new, entirely new last name for these boys to take on. So I don't know if that would have made it easier for her to get this thing through the courts uh, with less questions asked by the, the judge and whatnot. But I just thought that was telling because it's another way that uh, a jury member is going to look at this and think this is another form of eradication and elimination of Dan and the Markell family. I'm just glad that, oh, there goes my, my dog must hear John Singer's <laughs> dog and my dog starting to bark. So <laughs> it's actually not my dog, it's my neighbor's dog. So no. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll roll with it. Don't worry. My <laughs> dog heard that. You're going to get a chorus of barking here. So <laughs> I'm moving into a studio soon. Uh, Angela writes in. Should be a great show. Thanks, Joel, Judy, Carl, and John for being here. Hopefully uh, she will get here. John, um, Carl's going through the list. Here's a question from Jenny Wilson. Uh, does the panel think Charlie will implicate any of the other family members to get a lesser sentence? We've kind of gone over this, but John, what's your take? Sure. Uh, you've got some more time. I, I, don't, I don't think he will. Um, certainly not Donna, um, with whom he is extraordinarily close. Wendy would be the most likely um, uh, Adelson for him to turn on, if you will. But I, I really believe that he believes he's going to win. I think we know better and we know how compelling the evidence is against him. But that doesn't mean that in his own sort of deluded narcissistic world, he doesn't think that he can beat the charges and doesn't think that he's better than the good people in Tallahassee, i.e. the prosecutors. So I don't foresee a deal Rashbaum was super crystal clear at the last scheduling conference that he intends on trying the case. That doesn't mean he's somehow bound by that, but I do believe Charlie intends on trying it. And I do believe that he thinks he's going to prevail. And uh, John, I mean, Carl uh, started off with point number 40 in his list of 125 plus reasons why Wendy could, and he thinks should be indicted. Uh, what about this fact that she changed uh, the names from Markel to Adelson? Um, is that incriminating um, in a court of law, as he laid I, out? I don't know if that necessarily demonstrates consciousness of guilt, but at the same time, I think it's just another um, indicia of the cold-hearted, sort of callous person that she is. And if you're trying, if one of the issues at her trial is you know, could she actually be involved in the plot to kill the father of her children? Certainly these other factoids about how callous she is, about how um, she didn't let the grandparents see the kids, how she changed the name, how she erased the middle name. It, it sort of all goes to the mosaic of showing that she is a really disturbed and, and cruel person that could indeed be capable of being complicit in this sort of conspiracy. And uh, Abby, I think I'm going to get your last name right finally. Taha. Abby Taha. Uh, Yahoo. Not to be confused with Google. Catching a live with my favorite group of people. And then we've got Marina, a big friend of the show, who is watching us from the south of Spain, as well as Julie Fru, who's staying up late. Uh, in the UK. Uh, let's move to point 41, uh, Carl. And I, when I put this into my system, it reordered the numbers. So if I get confused on the actual numbers, uh, forgive me, but point 41 no. here. No worries. Um, Detective Isom, when he was interviewing Wendy the day of the hit, he asked her, do you think someone would do this for your benefit after Wendy suggested this is possibly being um, uh, an avenue to explore for suspects. And um, Wendy said no. And so what I thought was telling was that she never denies that this would benefit her. She never says, what do you mean benefit me? How's this going to benefit me? My boys lost their dad. So there's no words of like trauma affecting the boys. Um, her worried about the boys for at least 20 minutes into the interview. And then um, what also I thought was telling is that Detective Isom then follows it up with, well, what good does it serve and instead of answering that, Wendy just went on to some other discussion and Detective Isom didn't bring her back to that point he made or further do any deep dive questioning of that. So she's doing a lot of deflecting throughout her, her, both her testimony in court, the two times she's testified, as well as her interviews. So if you just...
a lot of what she's saying highlights what she's trying to avoid and how she's trying to reflect on others and, and really steer the investigation away from her. And she really did a good job of that because within 47 minutes of her being interviewed by Detective Isom, he tells her she's not a suspect. So she played it really well for, from that standpoint. The problem is if uh, for somebody like her, if you're, if you're going against her as a prosecutor, those kind of level of details, they're all going to come back. If when the prosecutor is looking at those kind of indicators to show her consciousness of guilt and her, her, her uh, efforts to take um, all the guilt and implication of evidence against both her and her family away from, away from that. Um, so anyway, I think, I think that is very telling and a juror is definitely going to pick up on those kind of little granular details. Uh, John, your uh, reaction to that point? I, I agree with that. I think it's a great point um, amongst many by Carl and, and, the interesting thing about the five hour um, videotaped uh, interrogation of her um, shortly after the murder was committed is th there are certainly snippets in there that are very, um, th they're certainly very uh, detrimental to Charlie. Others are detrimental to her. But in, in order to get the entire flavor of the interrogation, you, you sort of need to listen to the whole thing. That is impractical and, and not something that's going to happen at her trial, if, if there is one of her, they're not gonna play the entire five hour um, interrogation of her, which is a shame that, that it's so implausible and so unwieldy to do it, because once you hear it and you hear it several times, you get a much better sense as to what actually she was attempting to orchestrate during those five hours. If you play certain episodic moments of it, you don't get the full incomplete picture. Um, but but I, there's a lot of nuggets in that interrogation that I think are going to come back to harm her in the long run. Uh, and John, uh, baby doll, friend of the show, two questions. One of them was already asked, I believe. But uh, does the panel think Katie has made a true confession? Uh, we're talking about the proffer here and told everything about everybody. And do you think Charlie's going to take the rap for his mom and sister? I, I think we answer the latter. As far as the former goes, she's had so many opportunities to make a true and accurate confession that would have exonerated her and not exonerated her, but would have, would have resulted in her getting out of prison. So she didn't take the opportunity in either her first trial or the second trial to make a full and complete confession, which would have set her free. Um, why would she do it now? Especially when there's no guarantee that if she did, there'd be any lesser of a sentence. She's already put the state and the taxpayers through so much. She's put the prosecutors through uh, inordinate amounts of work. She's put the taxpayers through tons and tons of expenditures. So after convicting her and after almost convicting her the first time, she's not, there's, there's no guarantee if she told everything, she'd even get a better deal. So there was some reason, and I still don't know what it is, as far as why she didn't come clean in 19 before her first trial or in 22 before her second trial. People have speculated there's a monetary recompense there for her. Some have speculated that she's had trepidation about people harming her children. I don't know what the reason is, but if she wasn't gonna come clean then where she had to get out of jail free card, why is she gonna come clean now where there's no guarantee she'd even get any reduction in her sentence? Uh, Carl? If I could add to that. Yeah, sure. Please. Um, I, I think she spilled her guts I th as completely and fully as she could. I think the biggest problem would have been is that she doesn't have the corroboration necessary to make sure that she's a credible witness in court for Charlie's case or Donna or Wendy's case. So she's done so much damage that in order to make her credible, if she talks about all the interaction they had and when they met and all this kind of details, unless she's got some corroboration, like maybe a WhatsApp chat, that she saved on a phone that from years ago, those kind of concrete details to give corroboration that now she is telling the truth. I think she wasn't able to come up with those. And I think that's why the interview was over three different interviews. It was only four hours. I thought that was pretty surprising that yeah. her interviews were only four hours. And so it's, it just leads me to suspect it wasn't very fruitful for the prosecution of its user. So you, you could save the most damning stuff against all the Adelsons and talk about how you're planning it all down there and, in the uh, Miami high rise, but it's not going to do the prosecution any good unless you got some concrete details to back you up. Great. 
Uh, Carl, let's move on to the next point. And questions are rolling in for uh, Carl and John Singer. <clears throat> on uh, July 13th of 2014, Wendy says she could only leave Tallahassee if something happened to Dan. And, and that was brought up in the context of, of Jeff asking, would you ever leave for Miami? And I thought the timing of it was so suspect. Dan was killed five days later. And Wendy moves to Miami three days after that. So as Tim Jansen said before, there's no coincidences in, in a murder case, especially a heinous one like this. So I think the timing of her saying this, the issue of um, her talking about moving there, wh who can make this stuff up? I mean, truth is stranger than fiction. Those that are in criminal law really see that a whole lot. And so I, I, think, I think that's something that a jury's member is going to pick up on and it's going to help get her convicted. John, why are uh, criminals so dumb? I mean, why don't they at least wait a little while? I mean, I don't know if you recall her testimony from the second trial in 22, where they asked her, um, you know, had she ever come back to Tallahassee? Okay. And what were. And what, what did she okay, say? Okay, I'm back. She says, in addition to sort of deflecting, which is what she normally does, and says, well, I came back for a wedding. I came back for a bar mitzvah. I came back to give a speech. She says, you know, I only intended to go to South Beach for a couple of days. I, I packed an overnight bag. Um, but when the Florida, when the Tallahassee Police Department refused to provide protection for me and my boys, I deemed it to be unsafe. So she actually tried to sell to the jury and under questioning in the second trial that she was she was going to come back. She just packed it, you know, an overnight or a 48 hour bag. But she was too scared to come back. She, she never had any intention of ever returning to live in Tallahassee. The minute that memorial service was over, she was gone. That was the last she'd ever see of Tallahassee on any sort of permanent basis. Um, if she were smart, maybe she would have stayed a year. But again, every moment in Tallahassee was repugnant to her and, 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 almost, as, and almost as importantly, if not more importantly, to her mother. Uh, Carl, uh, you, you put the list together. Harold, anything but dull, a friend of the show. Isn't Jeffrey Lacoste the most important witness against Wendy? How do you respond to that question? Yeah, Harold's right. I mean, Wendy saw, uh, Wendy's case against her was solved, and uh, the best way to have that solved was what Jeff was telling Detective Isom. And so he had to go back there not just once, at their request, but he went there twice. If you think about it, he went back there twice back in July and also in March the following year because it was eating him so bad the way he had been really set up as the fall guy, the patsy for this thing. And so him also having that psychology background and really knowing the ins and outs and Wendy and all the little details of timings of things she said and also trying to find out when he's going up there uh, to Tennessee on that Friday, the morning of the hit, there's so many levels of detail that are just absolutely dynamite golden for the prosecution. So absolutely, you're going to use him. And I, I would say him and Wendy are the two witnesses against Wendy. And look who it is. We've got uh, Judy Tsang in the house, in her Hi. car. Um, <laughs> I can't hear you guys. Oh, uh, uh Let's see if we uh, can. Uh, I think something is wrong because I can't hear you. All right. We'll have to. I'll try to get uh, the chief technical officer yeah. on this. But for now, I'm going to pop you oh back my on. God. Um, what a day it is. Um, John, to you, Marina says, I'd like to know what is taking so long to charge the Adelsons. Um, this crime happened in 2014. It's a great it, it's a great question. It's a frustrating question and I think it's one of the reasons why this case has been such a centripetal force for so many of us. It's it's certainly um, anger at the fact that the Adelsons have been free for as long as they have, Charlie for eight years and uh, almost eight years and now Wendy and, and Donna and, and potentially Harvey um, all involved and, and all still walking free. I think that there's a playbook here that the prosecutors have employed and that is is that they're waiting and hoping before each trial to get some sort of confession to make the conviction of the person on trial that much easier. So if you take Magmanua part two, 
in the spring of 2022, when they realized she wasn't flipping, um, they decided that at that point they had to charge Charlie. I think we're hopeful all here that they employ the same strategy, that if we're on the eve of Charlie's trial in Q3 of 23 in October, that he hasn't pled to anything yet or, or given anyone else up, and I don't think he's going to, I, I think you could easily see Donna being charged at that time. So they're going methodically one by one. It's super frustrating. Um, Donna has is in her 70s now. She's been free for almost nine years. We, we all, I think, are in accord that Donna um, was in on it. Her own words sink her during the bump. Um, I think many of us have differing opinions on Wendy. We all have the same goal, which is to see Wendy get indicted. Um, I think we all have differing opinions on the strength of the case against her, but they're going one by one and, and it's super frustrating for everybody. I can only imagine how the Markels feel knowing what they know, which is that they were all involved. And uh, Jimmy C, a uh, friend of the show, along with his wife, Jeannie, uh, driving home from work, couldn't miss my favorite case, show, and guest. And speaking of guests, Judy, are you there? Yes. Can you hear me now? Well, we can hear you now. It's like the Verizon commercial. So, uh, Great. Yeah, thanks for joining us. And um, you, you're following this case much more closely than most of us. Um, what's sort of the very latest uh, with the Dan Markell murder case, um, Charlie Adelson and the rest of the gang? What, what, what's the newest information that you have? Well, newest information is that there is no information other than that the jury selection is supposed to start October 23rd with the testimony is supposed to start on October 30th. So that'll be right around the time of Charlie's birthday. So <laughs> it'll be kind of an interesting birthday for him being on trial then. And of course, you know, we all know that Katie's proffer is going to be kept sealed. Um, and then there's a question here, Judy, from Armand Fence. Why was there a continuance? Did uh, Katie's proffer have something to do with that? Um, it could have. It could have. I mean, but mainly Rashbaum was just saying he needed more time to prepare because there's just so many documents and um, recordings. There's a lot of evidence to sift through. Okay. I got a little static off you. I'm going to keep you muted when you're not talking. Um, Carl, to you, next point, please. All right. So 43, Jeff Lacoste at Katie's second trial noted that he found her to be deeply deceitful and not great at it. And then he also said that <clears throat> Wendy played me with lots of love bombing and manipulating. And so you square that against what Wendy says then in her testimony, both in the interviews as well as the two trials. And Wendy talks about how she's relieved to leave Tallahassee, or excuse me, the, the relief that the court uh, denied her motion to move to Miami. So that begs the question, which is the real Wendy? Because she's saying that she wants, she didn't mind staying in Tallahassee the next 15, 16 years. And yet they spent all this exorbitant money trying to fight Dan to get not only just a relocation to Miami, but to basically split it up from the previously agreed the year previous for split custody 50, 50 to her getting full custody. So Dan would only get limited weekend visitations and he's up in Tallahassee. So how is he going to work that? I mean, it was just such a ridiculous request. So I think that um, him, him being such a vital witness, as mentioned in that question from Harold, that Jeff is so material and important to put weight on Wendy to incriminate her and really bring out what kind of deceitful and manipulating um, things she's done to not only uh, set him up as a fall guy, but also if you look at her, the way she handled her interview with Detective Isom, the way she handled herself in court. I mean, it just it just reeks of something. Somebody's not going to do that unless they're actually in on the plan and we're part of it and they're trying to deflect. So it's deflect, deflect, deflect because you're guilty, not because you're innocent. John, your uh, legal opinion on that? Uh, I think that it's, and it's another great point. And if you recall from the Magmanua Garcia trial number one, when they asked Wendy, Georgia Kaplan asked Wendy, 
what her feeling was when the motion to relocate was denied. She said she was relieved, which, which is insane. I mean, anybody who spent a minute of time with her in Tallahassee would refute that. If, if there were to be a Wendy trial, not only would you have Jeff Lacoste getting up there and saying that the two things Wendy talked about 24 seven was how much she hated Dan and how much she hated Tallahassee, but they bring in dozens more witnesses to testify to the same thing, that all Wendy cared about was getting out of Tallahassee. The only way she was getting out of Tallahassee was if something happened to Dan, right? I mean, the kids were three and two at the time, so it was a long wait for her to get out of there. She wasn't leaving her kids. She said over and over again that Dan never intended to stay in Tallahassee for the long term, that he had designs of perhaps teaching at Harvard or joining his girlfriend Amy at NYU, but he had been in Tallahassee for seven years. There was no evidence that he was actively searching for an exit plan from Tallahassee. So, yeah, that's that's another thing that's going to sink her if there is a Wendy trial. And uh, Judy, feel, uh, please feel free to add to that if you'd like. But uh, Harold has a question. Uh, didn't make sense to wait not to indict Wendy until Charlie is convicted, question mark? So I think the question is, did it make sense or does it make sense? Um, yeah, I, I would say so. I mean, I feel like the prosecution is doing this methodically and trying to pick off them one by one. So it makes sense to go after Charlie, see what happens, and then probably move on to Donna and then Wendy. You know, we don't know what evidence there is out there and what Katie said against Wendy. But I would expect Donna to be arrested soon. And Judy, what about this list, just generally speaking, that Carl has compiled 125 plus reasons why Wendy should be indicted? I, I know you've seen and mm -hmm. talked to Carl. Uh, is he making good points here, salient points for the most part? Yeah, well, they're, they're all really good points. But on the other hand, you know, these are signs that Wendy was probably complicit and probably involved in the murder. But, you know, I feel like Katie really is the one to kind of be, be the big link to really help bring a conviction. Because, you know, a lot of the things, as you guys already saw, Wendy can still explain away a lot of those things that kind of make her look bad. You know, it doesn't show that she actively participated in the murder conspiracy. So just knowing about it is not enough. Uh, Papa Bear uh, saying hello from uh, Moscow, Idaho. Our thoughts always mm -hmm. uh, with the great town of Moscow. Uh, got Hillsboro, Oregon in the house. And then Harold Dull with an interesting comment here. Uh, I'm hoping Dan is visiting Charlie, Donna, and Wendy when they try to sleep at night. Judge Newman said something similar to Alec Murdoch at sentencing regarding Paul and Maggie. Uh, Judy, to that point, um, what do you think it's like to be Donna or Wendy with the uh, long arm of the law potentially about to grab your shoulder? Yeah, I would imagine Donna is a complete mess and probably needing drugs to go to sleep. I mean, because from what I recall, she was already a hot mess back when Wendy was trying to relocate. So, you know, this was even before Dan's murder happened, but I recall reading somewhere that she was already taking anti-anxiety medication or something was up with her mentally because she was so wound up and stressed out about Wendy's court proceedings and the judge denying the motion to relocate. So I can just imagine she's probably just hiding in the house you know, needing a lot of medication these days. And uh, not sure those, about Wendy. Yeah. For those of you who don't know, Judy Tsang is joining us late. She is an accomplished lawyer in her own right and uh, hosts a YouTube channel called Asian American Legal Focus. Shout out to Quilted Kitty Cat becoming a YouTube member. <laughs> Love the name. And uh, thank you for joining. Um, to you, Judy, uh, from Shivani, do we know the answer to this? As far as I know, the answer is yes. Is Charlie still being kept in solitary confinement? Uh, he's a high-profile in inmate. Do we know if he's by himself still? No, I, I don't think so. I could have sworn that he was put in the 
general population. And that's why he was sort of being harassed by this. Um, was he a rapist? There was some, some criminal who's in prison for life who had been just playing around with Charlie and maybe stealing his, um, what do you call it, stealing his tablet or messing around with his tablet. So um, as far as I know, Charlie is mixed in with the other people. I, I think in the, um, in one of the prior status conferences, he certainly was in solitary confinement because one of the arguments- John right, just froze up there. I'm sorry, John, you froze up for a sec. Say that oh, one more time. I'm sorry. In, in one of the status conferences um, that uh, was involving Rashbaum, he was presenting arguments as to why it was going to be super difficult to proceed in Q1 of 23. And, and he spoke about the difficulties logistically in reviewing documents with Charlie and Charlie having the opportunity to go to the library and things of that nature. At that time, Charlie was in solitary confinement. So certainly between April and September of 22, he was in solitary confinement per Rashbaum. That may have changed subsequent, but, but I do remember in one of the status conference hearing Rashbaum stated that, that Charlie was in solitary. Early on. Um, yeah. And then John, to you, uh, LJ writes, Rashbaum posturing, in my opinion, case is way too strong against Charlie. I think this might be in regards to why he asked for a continuance maybe. Um, do you see any of that? Do you see any posturing by the defense here? I think that Rashbaum internally and, and amongst his law partners and, and probably amongst his inner circle, he, he acknowledges, I'm sure, that this is a brutally difficult case. But again, what's the alternative? Is the prosecution really going to give Char Charlie some sort of sweetheart deal? I mean, if he gets 25 or 30 years, you know, that makes that puts him in jail till he's in his late 70s. So if it's 30 years, so why would they be incentivized, the prosecution, to give the mastermind um, the of this entire conspiracy some sort of a light sentence, especially given how much evidence they have against him? So what Rashbaum is saying certainly may not comport with what he feels, but I don't believe there's going to be any sort of a plea deal here. I don't I don't know what he there is to offer Charlie that would be palatable to him. Um, Armand Fence, Carl writes, Wendy claims the names uh, were changed for security. The name was changed for security reasons. Irony is that the Adelson name is disliked. Carl, that's a pretty good point. Um, I don't know if Armand's an attorney, but uh, your reaction to that and the next point, please. Well, that's, yeah, that is a good point because the Adelson name was right up there with the Markel name in terms of Dan Markel being the victim. But as terms of suspects, the Adelsons were the key suspects, maybe not initially, but within that uh, short time after the arrest of the two hitmen, obviously the Adelson name came back to life. So I think it just goes to show that they thought they played this so well. Wendy played the detective in the initial interview so well. And then even after they fled to Miami a couple days later, the, and they invoked, they lawyered up, and they didn't cooperate with the police anymore, she still, from what I've seen in the evidence, they still did not really target anything from Miami being the source of the hit. They still were thinking it was something going on with, a, with a, maybe somebody in the student body there or maybe some girlfriend or something like that for Dan. They really didn't know what it was. But it seemed very clear that they had ruled out the Adelsons and everything Jeff was saying is just sort of like him being a, a jilted lover, just sort of um, trying trying to put some uh, weight back on the uh, Adelsons. But they soon soon learned within a year that you know everything Jeff was saying was spot on, and they should have been going after the Adelsons from the get go. By the way, uh, Carl, kudos to your producer, aka your nephew. Your lighting looks <laughs> phenomenal. So. Mm. Uh, you, should, you should take him with you. Um, Thanks, okay, on to, next, on to the next point. On to the next point here. Um, for the next one, we have <clears throat> Wendy emptied the joint safe deposit box in July of 2012. So that was way before the actual contested hearing, and way before Dan was murdered. And she also completed the divorce parenting course as mandatory for any divorce. Most states have those where you got to go through some uh, training and sit through that and understand how if, if you have um, fights with your ex 
with the kids being uh, involved in, in the divorce, it's very harmful for the kids. So it's a way to, to waken up the eyes of the divorcing parents to say, don't, don't bring your kids into your adult fights. And so she completed that way beforehand um, a filing, but she also completed or was ongoing in counseling with, with Dan. So what happened was Dan is being strung along thinking that, hey, she's going to counseling with me. She's working and saving the marriage. But meanwhile, the complete opposite was happening. She'd already planned to extract herself from the marriage, was ready to do the, the Pearl Harbor divorce against Dan. So I thought that was very telling. It's something that jurors are really going to look at and, and see that she is extremely calculating. And this is why they, they will feel rest assured that she was involved in it when they, when they vote to convict her. And Judy, I'm curious to get your response to that. So he's basically saying that she, you know, she was in marriage counseling, but yet calculating mm -hmm. and looking for a way to extract herself from the marriage. But does that point to, uh, as you lawyers say, consciousness of guilt when it comes to uh, committing this crime? Yeah. Well, I mean, it shows her typical modus operandi, in my opinion. Um, what I recall hearing is that Wendy had also been supposedly planning a birthday party for Dan during this whole time that she was already cooking up the scheme to to ditch him. So she had been contacting friends, you know, saying it was a surprise party and stuff. But then when she pulled the rug from under him, then of course there was no party. So, um, you know, it, it just seems like she does have it in her to be very calculating and manipulative and planning. And the same thing goes with Donna. Donna was very active in helping Wendy plan you know, plan to move and take all the stuff and separate from Dan without his knowledge. So it just seems kind of uncanny how most likely they were all cooking up this scheme to kill him off, too, in such a calculated fashion. And a comment that I'm almost sure John Singer will not disagree with from Baby Doll. Wendy's the worst. I just rewatched her testimonies, trying to go toe to toe with Georgia. Girl, bye. George ate her alive. Cannot wait to see justice all the way. Followed by Jeannie, a friend of the show, who says, smartest move there, Wendy. Change their name to Adelson. They'll be much safer that way. She is 1,000 or 10,000. I can't see any more percent involved. Um, I just, Joel, um, it just, that's emblematic of how nimble a witness she is. They asked her this question um, at the second trial. They said, well, you changed the name. Right. And she said, yeah, I changed the name because there was so much, you know, publicity out there about this case. And Markel was in the news. And and then they said, well, what about Adelson? You know, Adelson seems to be more of a dangerous selection. She said, well, without without even a pause, she said, well, at some point we're going to change all our names to something else entirely. Right. We're not going to change it back to Markel. We're not going to keep it as Adelson. So she she's agile as a witness. She she uh, without any pause or, or any sort of breath. She just said, yeah, we're going to, we're going to change it to some third party name. So that just shows you what type of witness she's going to be um, in the next trial, the next trial, and then maybe even her own trial. Snaky. Uh, Nisi, yep. anyone who says uh, anything about Jersey is going to get called out in a good way on my show. The hat from my hometown. Hi shout out to Highland Park, New Jersey. Uh, Nisi writes, hi, Jersey girl here. My girl, my girls have Jersey girl shirts. Uh, Helen Stewart says deflect repeat followed by Andy school. Who's uh, usually tuned in and with very intelligent comments. Wendy tried to direct law enforcement to professor Jeff Carr. Similar. There are far too many coincidences. No way did she not want this and plan it with her mom and brother. More delays for October possible question mark. Um, Carl, do you think we could see a further continuance? And uh, then we'll take your next point, Carl. I think the only way there's going to be continuance if there's like an emergency type situation with maybe a key witness um, or maybe if Rochbaum is getting fired by, um, by Charlie. So it also goes back to what my point is that I've been making for a while now, which is I don't see any logical or rational sense for these other Adelsons to not be charged now as opposed to waiting for Charlie's trial or Charlie's convict, conviction. Charlie is adamantly, um, no doubt, there's zero doubts that Charlie's going to be convicted 
when he goes to trial. So if you have that already um, locked in the bag, so to speak, not that they don't have to do all the presentation of evidence and do a good job at it, but they, they got such a strong, overwhelming case against Charlie. So with that being the case, why would you wait two, at least two more years before you charge Wendy? And then she goes to trial after two years. And then after that, two more years, then Donna. And then you got to, so you'd be waiting for four years for Donna to get to trial. Or let's switch those around. You're waiting four more years to get, to get um, Wendy to trial. So to me, there's no good reason from having worked so many felony cases that you'd want to wait as a prosecutor for that to happen because evidence can degrade over time. Now, if you got something solid like a videotape and whatnot, like Charlie on the uh, Dulce Vida tape, that's not going to degrade over time. In fact, they got enhancement over time, but generally witnesses become unavailable for whatever number of reasons. Maybe somebody gets sick, a mature witness gets sick, or maybe uh, God forbid they die. So those are kind of things that I, in the back of my mind as a, as a trial attorney, no matter what side I'm on, I'm always thinking like, I don't want to have to lose witnesses here. And so that's something to, to speed stuff up. So I've not heard a single reason why, other than, than saying it's a good methodical approach to wait to charge them in a daisy chain effect. Because if you already know Charlie's going down, why can't you charge one of the other Adelsons now uh, or both of them or all of them at this point? I think that's a great, I think it's a great point, and, and I, I, I do agree with Carl on that. Um, I think that the methodical approach has been the prosecution's approach for whatever reason. So I think one, one of the prior questions was, why haven't they charged them yet? Because that's, that's not been their playbook. But I, I agree with Carl. There is concern about certain witnesses. Um, Luis Rivera is a good example. Um, his, his performance in trial two First trial one was far inferior. His memory was far worse. He's also not in the safest of living situations right now, i.e. in prison. So who's to say that he's going to make it to a fifth trial if we get to that? So I, I would have charged them all by now. Maybe I guess the only thing I would push back on vis-a-vis -vis what Carl said is whereas we are all in accord that the evidence against Charlie is extraordinarily strong. And whereas we all think he's going to get convicted, there's no such thing as a sure thing in these trials. Look what happened to Katie. It, it, what, was it 11-1 or 10-2 in the first one? And the reason that the person gave for not convicting was because they felt sorry for her, that she was, you know, that the kids were going to lose both their parents. I mean, we've seen other cases where slam dunks, i.e. O.J. Simpson, didn't result in a conviction. So I, I, I guess the thought process from the prosecution is maybe he will flip at the 11th hour. Maybe 25 years is more palatable to him than life in prison. Hence, we could kill two birds with one stone, get him away for two and a half decades or three decades and get Donna on a slam dunk. I, I don't know. I, I do agree with Carl. I would have charged them all. At this point, I would have charged them all years ago, back in 16 when they had the probable cause affidavit, but, but that's not the strategy they've employed, unfortunately. Um, Carl, before we move on, this is an interesting question for Judy here from King Ash. Can a guest, i.e. Judy, explain in detail the legal immunity Wendy has? Can issues she happened to testify about be investigated independently with the results of that investigation uh, used against her, uh, Judy. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm actually um, here in a parking lot here. I have some stuff going on, but um, I hope you can hear me too because there's yeah. some loud construction going. On. <laughs> we're um, good. Yeah. So this is where I wish Tim Jansen were here. You know, somebody who's a Florida criminal defense attorney. But as far as I understand it, she just could not be prosecuted for, um, or, yeah, she's basically immune in regards to whatever she set up on the stand. So whatever information that they didn't normally have already through other means, um, you know, they can't use that against her in a criminal proceeding. So it, it doesn't mean she's totally immune, obviously. They can still go after her, but they can't use her testimony right. against her. Is that right, what you right. understand? Carl, sure, right. go for it. And Judy, I know you've got your hands full. I see your kid there. So feel free. We're going to do it again next week. It's up to you. You're welcome to stay, but no no hard feelings if you've got to uh, take off. But Carl, uh, you want to add sure. to that? 
Um, immunity is, is pretty universal in most jurisdictions, and uh, they may have different nuances. Like I know Florida has a different nuance, but the general rule is basically if you're given any kind of immunity, the only way you could ever be prosecuted is if government can prove you lied. Okay, so I think they got ample evidence from what I've seen for my jurisdictions when you could easily be charged and convicted of lying. And so for that to come forward, to bring her testimony in from her first two trials, the only way they're going to get it in to Wendy's trial is if they charge her with perjury. So I would expect that they would do something like that to make sure all that comes in because all of her inconsistencies, especially the one about that um, her, in her first trial, she said she never drove down Trescott. I mean, that is a hugely damning point that a jury is really going to pick up on. Um, John, I'm going to put you on the spot with Baby Doll's question. So who truly came up with the idea first to off Dan Markell? What's your thought? And then we'll get back to the list. Uh, I think that Donna harangued Charlie to the point where Charlie said, I'll take care of it. Charlie came up with the idea. Donna, it was done, in my opinion, primarily for Donna. It was done at after Donna had driven him to the point where he had to come up with something to solve the problem up north. And I think at the end of the day, Wendy was on board with it. I don't think that Wendy initially embraced the plan. I think that she pushed back. Again, if you look at the emails, between she and Donna during the divorce proceeding, Donna is pushing, 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 telling Wendy she's not doing her part. And ultimately when they, when, when relocation failed and when Donna was in peril of losing unsupervised visits with the kids, that was the last straw. Charlie came up with the idea and Wendy was on board. That's my opinion. Others on the panel may have a different opinion, but that's always been my opinion. That is a fairly informed opinion. Uh, Carl, let's move on with this list that we're going to fin finalize uh, in the next millennium. But <clears throat> let's move forward now. Well, and this actually dovetails with just what John said, which is, and this is brought up in our previous discussions on Survivor, which is that on a 14 February motion to the court, Dan actually specified that Wendy's behavior in her, in her divorce actions and what she misrepresented filings didn't serve her as, as being fit to be an FSU law professor, teaching other students how to be good ethical attorneys, in other words. So I, I think that's really the trigger that if there was any hesitation from Wendy at that point, that's what really wanted, forced her to want to get this thing moving out. And I think she was totally on board with it and she played right along with it and had to do all these things pre-murder day, as I call it, to, to be able to come up with um, ways to help execute the operational plan of the murder. Go for it, John. I, I feel like I'm a big impediment to Carl ever completing this list. Um, but I want to demarcate between the lawyer and the non-lawyer. So I believe, and this is where I push back on Carl a bit, Wendy's a lawyer. She knows that stuff that goes into court filings is inflammatory. There's lots of invective. And I think that people say things in these filings that um, lawyers don't take as seriously um, as non-lawyers do. I think Donna flipped out when she, I don't think Wendy flipped out when she saw the allegations about her not being truthful on her financial disclosures. That's a common allegation in divorce proceedings. I don't think Wendy felt she was in peril of losing her law license. I, I think that Wendy doesn't take very much seriously when things are, when things are uh, levied at her. Donna, on the other hand, I think went crazy when she saw the motion about how she had been disparaging um, Dan to the boys and how she was at risk of having some coordinator sit with her. That didn't sit well with a non-lawyer. She took it really seriously. Wendy lied through her teeth about that um, during uh, the last trial when she said that um, none of us took those filings seriously. I think Donna did. And I think that was the last straw. That was the culmination. But I don't really think those filings about in, in the allegations therein that were lodged towards Wendy were of much concern to Wendy. That, that's my opinion. I, I'd like, I'd be curious what Judy thinks. Carl and I have, have debated that one before. Judy. 
Yeah, I would think that Wendy probably was worried because remember, she had not even been out of law school for long. So what was it? I think she graduated from law school around 2006-ish. I think it was so, I think seven she graduated. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So she hadn't been uh, she hadn't been out of law school that long. And Dan had the much more prestigious job. And remember, the dean of the law school also loved Dan. So Dan was like the little pet, you know, the pride and joy of the law school where the dean basically would do anything to have Dan stay there instead of leaving for Ivy League pastors or better law school. So I, I think it, Wendy probably was a little bit scared about her job because um, weren't there allegations that Dan was telling colleagues that she had mental problems, you know? So I, I'm sure Wendy was kind of afraid for her job also. But I agree with John that Donna was probably a complete mess and freaking out as as a lay person who was very, very invested in this whole custody case. Yeah, because to dovetail off of that, Judy, keep in mind, Dan was given a special assignment to boost his pay. They actually boosted his pay, I think, by like 40, 50,000. So he went from being an average professor at FSU to them really realizing what a great rock star type of law professor he was, where he's getting international attention. And so Wendy, on the other hand, she's like an adjunct professor. Those are like contract professors. So you go from Dan being the rock star, like a, bringing all this positive attention to FSU Law School. Wendy, on the other hand, doing something that's in the trenches as an adjunct, has no tenureship, and just serving from a few years at a time, and maybe won't get it renewed. So Dan mentioning the fact that she's not fit to serve and having the ear of the Dean and the leadership. I mean, it wouldn't take much for Dan to be able to say, look, look what she did. Look at these court filings. And Oh, by the way, um, I don't, I don't think I can work here if you're going to have Wendy on this staff anymore. So it would have been that easy to get Wendy, Wendy uh, exterminated from her job. Hey, hey John, um, Harold writes, uh, who are the most important witnesses to prove an act in furtherance? Jeff. I mean, I think Jeff Lacasse is is uh, is the big one on that one because, uh, as has been pointed out, mere knowledge of a crime in Florida is not enough to um, charge someone with uh, the felony that they'd be seeking to charge her with. We, she has to have been deemed to have engaged in acts, overt acts, in furtherance of the conspiracy. What were those acts? Well, um, one act was uh, what she did with Jeff Lacasse. Um, she had told Jeff Lacasse, you know, right before um, that, right before that they had this breakup where she sent him the cease and desist letter. Um, she wanted to know whether he still planned on going um, to Tennessee at Friday at 11 a.m., i.e. the same exact time that the murder had been committed and the um, those who committed the murder were fleeing the scene. So Jeff, in a very similarly looking car, was going to be leaving at the concurrent time um, that the murderers were leaving the scene. Um, other overt acts that she engaged in were telling, she, she knew when Dan was leaving town, she knew he was leaving town on Saturday morning, July 18th. She told people that were involved in the conspiracy that it had to be done on Friday, July 18th, or they were gonna lose their window. That's an overt act in furtherance of the conspiracy. So you have Jeff Lacasse who can buttress um, that notion. You have um, uh, perhaps others as well. But I think Jeff ultimately is going to be the best witness against Wendy other than Wendy herself, as uh, <laughs> Carl pointed out. And uh, Carl, before we move on, and I think Judy uh, just had too much going on. Um, she, there was some confusion about the time. So apologies for that. But uh, that sort of thing happens. Uh, and Vroom to you, Carl. Uh, do the panelists think Florida could build as good a circumstantial case versus Wendy vis-a-vis -vis conspiracy to commit murder as Idaho has, which is going on right now, versus uh, Lori Vallow, uh, Daybell, which I'm not sure if you followed that case, but what about the first part of this question? Well, I think that um, there is a strong circumstantial case. I think these all these data points are so many and so differing of degree of how much they are an indicator of consciousness of guilt and planning. 
but there's so many of them that from my experience working with jurors, they may not agree with all of them, just like uh, maybe John and I and, and, and Judy or, or Tim when he's on, we may not agree with which ones are the strongest, but we all agree that there are different degrees of proof. And so as a, if, you, as, if you look at it from the totality of all the evidence, the totality is what gets you over the, over the hurdle of proving it beyond reasonable doubt. And so that is what I'm looking at. It's like, if you look at the totality, there's no way a juror is going to ever come back. Initially, maybe they're going to look at it and say, well, I'm not so sure. And what's going to happen is the other majority of the jurors are going to go through the evidence and discuss every little detail and point out these details as, as indicating consciousness of guilt. And through that, you're going to have a conviction. Just like in the Murdo case, people are saying, well, you don't really have any direct evidence. There's no direct evidence. Well, when they had the videotape of him being there within 10, 15 minutes of the murder and him talking and then him denying that that whole time, right there, that was pretty much game over for Murdo. And then everything else dovetailed off of that. It was sort of like a building block of his, of his own jail cell. Okay, so Wendy has all these building blocks for her jail cell. So I don't see any problem whatsoever with any prosecutor who has experience going into circumstantial evidence and having the confidence there's no way that I see that uh, Wendy would not go down as, as a convicted of both murder one and conspiracy. Uh, Teresa comments. I'd love to know why Catherine didn't come clean at first, followed by Andy school's comment, which might suggest why is it possible that the better deal for Katie is that the Adelson matriarch promised to covertly care for her children uh, so maybe there was some sort of financial deal that no one is really fully aware of where the kids are taken care of. And she says, I'll go to prison for life. Although uh, as much as I love my kids uh, and I do anything for them, I don't know that I want to spend my life in prison. Maybe I would just, uh, I don't know, uh, buy less expensive things. I don't know. Um, Elizabeth, we love this. I'm new to the show and I'm obsessed. As I like to say, STS is a much better addiction than crack. So you're, you're on the right road at least. Um, Carl, what is the next point? Um, and we'll go for, I don't know, a little while longer and uh, see how many of these we can get through. All right. For 46, Wendy tells of the hit man three different times the week of Dan's murder. Two of the times she mentioned is a joke, but one of the times it's also mentioned is serious. So granted, she's going to, have to mention that sect of Isom, but the fact that she mentions it to Jeff, both in a serious tone, it's like, hey, there was a really a plan that, that Charlie looked into a year previous to take out um, Dan, but then she also mentions it to the TV repairman. I mean, the TV repairman is just such a odd comment to make. And like we said earlier, the whole e issue with the, the TV being the code, for everyone involved in murder. That's an easy way to figure out who's involved in murder if they were part of the code. Well, she was speaking part of the code when she's talking about why Charlie bought the TV, how he bought it instead of a hitman. I mean, that, that's just such a bizarre, odd comment to make. And that's within hours of Dan being murdered. So that you don't have those kind of coincidences in real life without there actually being part of a plan. It's part of a stupid plan. This wasn't a well-planned murder. It's just that they were able to bumble through this and, and things weren't picked up. And I think the fact that they were part of a dentist and lawyer family, I, I think law enforcement just never put that really in, in the proper gun size to think, could people like that really exist in Florida where they'd really kill a, a law professor when they've got a highly successful practice, they got millions of dollars rolling around. Why would they do something that stupid? So I think all that lends itself to, to being a, you know, sort of a reasonable explanation of why they didn't think they need to focus more on Miami. But nonetheless, all the evidence gradually pointed to there. The more they dig in this case, the more it points to the Adelsons, including Wendy. John, any comments on that? Yeah, I, th I think that the, the most, one of the most damning pieces of evidence, and it, it's not really necessarily against Wendy, it's, it's almost, I, I would think it's even stronger against Charlie, is when she says to Jeff LaCasse on July 13th, just five days before the murder, um, in a dead serious tone, that Charlie had looked into hiring a hitman in the summer of 2013. And of course, what's the significance of that timing? 
that's when the motion for relocation was denied with prejudice. So that makes sense that he began that exploration process back then. Um, that in and of itself is a killer for Charlie. And in fact, Jeff Lacasse is believable. He has no incentive to lie. So if you ascribe any veracity to him as a witness, and, and by all intents and purposes, he seems like an honest fellow, that's going to nail Charlie. Um, what she said to the, to the repairman, see, and I hate to channel calm here, but we're complex beings, all of us, right? There's no such thing as a good person and a bad person. And I learned that from your mother, that we're all made up of different characteristics, qualities. There's good to us. There's bad to us. Wendy it was, is very smart in certain areas. As a witness, she's able to parry questions in her favor. But with the repairman, I don't think that was some sort of grand plan on her part to um, with some sort of a, a forethought as to how that would look going forward. I think that she just blurted it out. She probably had some guilt deep down in the recesses of her mind and probably just blurted it out to the repairman, just like she sort of laughs nervously on the witness stand at inappropriate times at, at questions that, that really shouldn't elicit laughter. So getting back to what she said to Jeff Lacasse in that deadpan voice in, in her kitchen, that Charlie looked into hiring Hitman, that is the most compelling piece of evidence I think there is against Charlie. And I think it, it probably it will hurt her as well. And uh, by the way, shout out to Norla in uh, Sydney, Australia, seven in the morning. Hello to our Aussie uh, peeps out there. Nicole, uh, the best evidence she says against Donna, that bump video. I love the bump video, she says. Uh, Carl, what is the next point you have there? <clears throat> Wendy failed to notify Dan's parents, the Markels in Canada, when she learned that Dan had been had been shot that day, and she never asked to be interrupting uh, the interview with Isom, including when the victim advocate is in there. She calls her her mom, and but she never makes the point of calling. Dan's parents, which is, you know, a common courtesy, common respect thing to do. You're really going to have somebody that doesn't really know the history of uh, their relationship. They don't, they're not good friends with Dan's good friends, obviously, but they know a lot about Wendy. So I think for Wendy not to call them and then to uh, unite that also with the fact that Wendy said that in her interview with Detective Isom at one point, she says that they're going to think I killed him or worse to that effect. So why would she think that? Detective Isom never asked the follow-up. Well, why would they think that you were behind killing of Dan? I mean, that would have been very uh, telling to find out what she would have said to that. But it was just sort of left at that because she'd already been cleared. So I, I just think that also the um, it made it look like she was acting in good faith to try to help solve this. Remember how she kept on saying, well, who would do this? Who would do this? And at different moments, she would start to cry. Those that when the questions are directed towards her, she'd start to cry if, if she's thinking, well, maybe I'm not going to get away with being a, a, a non-suspect. So anyway, I, th I just thought that was, um, that was another indicator of, uh, of her involvement. John, God forbid something would happen to your wife. Would you forget to call her family or, or, or not maybe forget, but just neglect to call her family? I, I would not. <laughs> um, <laughs> I would not. And your wife is happy about that. How about this? Mad Marsha. Uh, to me, unless Wendy repudiates her family, she is guilty. She is the only one who gained from Dan's death. That's really a good point. I mean, I guess, Carl, you could make the argument that as a grandparent, um, you know, Donna gained, so she didn't have to schlep up to Tallahassee. Um, but it's a pretty good point. I mean, Wendy's really the one that, that gets all the benefit out of this, correct? I, I see. I disagree with that one. Oh, go ahead. Don, everything to gain from this. Uh, it, schlepping up eight hours or however long it took on on that that unscenic drive, she hated it. She hated Tallahassee. And, and if you listen to the wiretaps that, that Fancy Fiction has been kind enough to post to satiate all of our collective obsessions, who is always with the kids? Donna. Donna is with those kids 24-7. Wendy's on a date, Wendy's at work, Wendy's with friends. Donna is with those kids over and over again. Her whole reason to live at that point with three grown children was 
to be around those children. She had everything to gain from this, everything to gain. So I, I think that Donna, as I said from the beginning, was the big driver here. Um, and I, I think that she was behind it. That's what I've always said. And, and John, Roxanne says, what are the reasons they're not arresting Donna, Wendy, and Harvey? Is there something we are all missing or does our justice system work in ways that we just don't know? There's never been anything on the public record, uh, i.e. the court records, that says you know, specifically why they would not go ahead and make these arrests, right? No, it's it's just been it's it's been their playbook. It's been the way they've proceeded. It's one after another, and I think the one that's the hardest to swallow isn't even Wendy because Wendy is still what is she forty three, forty four. When they get to her, she's still got half her life in prison. Um, hopefully, yes. it's really Donna. She time is ticking. Donna's almost seventy three. If they get to her in a couple of years and they have another trial she could be looking at 77, 78. So she finally has to go to prison. She's been free for so long. And on those wiretaps, she says it straight up, which one of your prior questioners alluded to. She says it involves the two of us. I think you know what I'm talking about. So, I mean, the evidence against her has been so compelling since the inception. It, it's so hard to swallow why she's sitting, you know, free right now. Uh, I can tell you the only good thing Donna has going for her is uh, we just had three or two female ex-cons on to discuss what life could be like for Lori Vallow Daybell. And I joked that I hope my own lovely mother who was hosting that night does not end up behind bars at 83, <laughs> uh, even though she's feisty. And the female ex-con said that uh, if you are above the age of 80, the older you are in a female jail or prison, you are very well respected and uh, you are not to be messed with. So uh, that's about the only thing Donna can look forward to. Um, and uh, I'm sure John's not looking forward to Saturday. It's Wendy's birthday. Uh, but I bet you I know someone who is. I bet you fancy fiction who knows more about this case than anyone. I can almost assure you and I've not spoken to her. There will be something on her channel on fancy fiction. Fancy with an eye like Wendy with an eye uh, on YouTube. Uh, this Saturday as a special birthday present to Wendy. Um, without further ado, uh, Carl, uh, let's continue on and uh, we'll wrap in, uh, I don't know, five, 10 minutes. Sean, are you okay with that? Yep. I just, yep. The kids are starting to percolate in the background. So uh, I'm good. I think <laughs> I, I have expiration date of about seven minutes. I can, uh, I can see you looking your way. There've been, uh, we had the dogs, had the landscaper, um, we had Judy in the car. It's been quite the show. So we have days like that. But uh, Carl, Carl, who's the voice of uh, reason and a man of utter stability, um, carry us through to the next point or two, and then we'll wrap it up. All right, 48, as a lawyer, Wendy had to expect her phone to be searched or request for search when she was there at the police station. So for her to give that up, they had to read her her rights on a form. And she was asking again if she's a suspect. So she was worried about her um, still being fingered as a prime suspect for this murder of Dan, or at that point, um, attempted murder. And so for her to go from, if you look at the dichotomy between her being so cooperative and friendly to the police and, and, and trying to do her best to act like a victim, although a very terrible job, and all this deflection going on, to then within days later of wanting nothing to do with the police, completely staying away from that, hiring a lawyer. It just, it just goes to show that, to me, it goes to show, and I think any juror would see that this was all planned out. It, it, it reeks of planning because her mindset to go from, oh, let me cooperate, let me try to help solve it. I mean, three times in the first hour, she mentioned that she didn't think that Dan would, would have done this to himself. Well, she didn't even ask any details about how he was shot. So why would she offer something up like that? So the more you study the details, the more you see how much guilty uh, Wendy is. By the way, happy birthday, JPJ, this Saturday. Um, and Shaq Oatmeal's in the house. Uh, John, anything, any response to uh, this nope. last point? Nope. All right, let's, uh, let's get to uh, through 50. So I think we're at 49 now, uh, Carl. All right. So Wendy did test her efforts to frame Jeff and deflect from her, as we had said before, previously. And for example, uh, one of the data points is that she says, it sounds crazy when I talk about Jeff this way, 
And that you hear the victim advocates say, well, I don't think so. So she's doing a lot of suggestions like who'd have done this? Why would they do this? But never asking the details of what happened that day. So I think all this is, is, is very calculated uh, deception and deflection and somebody who's experienced in, in picking apart liars, I think would easily pick up on that. Uh, Roxanne says, John, perhaps the most important question of the day, are those little figurines behind you or tiny liquor bottles? Um, <laughs> those are very large liquor bottles, but they look very small given the angle of the camera. <laughs> but I just want to say something um, in response to what, it is a full bar, Victoria. I want to say something in response to what Carl said about pinning the blame on Jeff. Just to be clear and, and to um, go back to what she said during the interrogation, she actually didn't offer up Jeff as a suspect. It was offered up by the woman who came to spend some time with her. It was the woman who knew Jeff and Wendy both had set them up on a blind date. She was there to support Wendy and, and be some sort of a shoulder um, to cry on. It was that person, and again, I, I think it was Jane McPherson, was the name, if it's if I'm remembering correctly, who offered up Jeff as a suspect and said, you know, Jeff is is jealous and, and Jeff, um, you know, it may have that in him to let that jealous manifest itself in a negative way. And when he said, you're right, you know, I really hope it isn't Jeff. So maybe that was part of Wendy's um, consistent playbook where she was going to not be too overt and offer those things up. Um, you know, because it would look too transparent. Maybe she was waiting for someone else to say it and then she'd pounce on it. But but she it wasn't at her impetus that Jeff's name was invoked at that during that interrogation. Um, and this is interesting and important to point out from Art Nixie here. Not everyone agrees about Wendy. And uh, Art Nixie says, just here to say, not everybody believes Wendy was involved. She's allowed to leave her marriage however is safe for her and went on to say uh, to me, the Wendy hate train is juvenile, misogynistic and devoid of evidence. John, would you like to respond to that? Um, <laughs> I, 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 certainly not misogynistic. Um, it's nothing to do with Wendy being male, female. Um, it's certainly not juvenile. And I think Carl would agree that it's replete with evidence, not devoid of evidence. Carl's got, you know, 150 points or 200 points um, that evidence culpability to some gradation or another about Wendy's involvement. But again, it all comes down to Jeff Lacasse, I believe. If you believe Jeff Lacasse, then Wendy is guilty. Why in the world, after breaking up, would Wendy then say to Jeff, hey, are you still going to Tennessee on Friday, i.e., the exact same time that the murder was going to be effectuated and the hitmen were going to be fleeing Trescott, why in the world would she care what Jeff Lacasse was doing on Friday, Thursday, two years from now, given the fact that they were breaking up? Who cares about the minutia of an ex's travel schedule unless you're looking to set that person up as a patsy? If you believe Jeff Lacasse that that conversation with Wendy took place, in the parking lot after that fraught yoga class, then Wendy is guilty. A um, couple of important people here. Um, Frankie Figs, a big friend of the show. Uh, how about you try to set up Jeffrey, uh, to John's point as well, back to, at Art Nixie. Um, down the rabbit hole says, I heard she's going to change her name to Singer. Watch out, John. And then uh, <laughs> another... Uh, Big friend of the show, uh, Katie Cool Lady. Uh, that agility speaks to sociopathy to me. I've seen it in action on the stand, and she's right in line with that confidence and slipperiness. So, uh, mm. well, and then Art, Art, Art Nixie, just to be fair, responds She did not try to set up Jeffrey. He has made himself the center of the universe. He had an ordinary car. Wendy's friend was the one who pushed Jeffrey. Uh, to the police. Um, so uh, there are some uh, detractors here. Um, and uh, that's what makes America, America. People can uh, agree to disagree here. Carl, uh, let's do two more points. All right. 
For 50, Wendy, as you may recall, disinvited Dan's parents, Phil and Ruth Markel, to the bar mitzvah for one of their boys. And for Jewish culture, that is like the most important time in the formative years of a child. And so to abruptly stop that after Charlie got arrested was just so cold and calculating. And um, it just is revealing that they didn't want to have any of the Markells around to see how they're acting and in case any conversation came up about Charlie. Obviously, the Markells wouldn't have done anything improper. In fact, they were even seeing a child psychologists to make sure they didn't do something improper around the family and do any efforts to uh, do anything to give them more efforts to uh, remove any visitation that they so desperately sought. So for that to happen, again, it shows that if you're willing to punish the boys, and this is a memory that's going to be ingrained in their, their um, lives forever, to not have your grandparents from Canada there, it's just so sick and disgusting and troubling that um, I, I think it's parcel and parcel of, about what a lot of the mindset was going on there with the Adelson. And uh, John, before you weigh in there, uh, Catherine, um, and for full disclosure, I am in contact with uh, Ruth Markell, Dan's mother. Uh, and she is a great woman. Um, she has her book out, which is on my shelf called The Unveiling right here. You should pick it up if you haven't already. Uh, she, uh, Catherine comments, do the children have a child advocacy lawyer and can the paternal grandparents get custody if she and her brother are convicted? Uh, I flat out don't know the answer. I know right now they've got all sorts of uh, rights issues going on. Uh, John, do you have any idea if they were to get convicted, um, if that would be a problem? So, so the Markell Act, the way I understand it, um, is if Wendy is convicted or if she is found guilty of wrongful death in a civil suit, um, then I believe the parent, the grandparents uh, could gain custody. The, the only trepidation I have in answering that is I don't know if the act works retroactively. So going forward from 2022 forward for any grandparent in the same situation, a conviction or a finding of um, finding of liability, sorry, not guilty, finding of liability, in a wrongful death case would then um, confer rights on the grandparents. If that were to happen here with Wendy, either with a guilty verdict or with a finding of liability for a wrongful death uh, in a wrongful death case, I just don't know if the act works for the Adelson, for, for the Markells, uh, because it was enacted in 2022. So I don't know if it has retroactive effect. And uh, Ruth has worked hard on uh, grand. Uh, parent rights, which is a big deal, uh, especially and, if you're a grandparent. And um, the sad part, and the sad part with Ruth, is we can say whatever we want in an unfettered way and in an uncensored way about Wendy and about Charlie and about Harvey, but Ruth can't because she still needs to play ball, if you will, with Wendy to have any chance of seeing those children, whether it's via Zoom or whether it's in person. She has to mince her words and she, she has to be very careful with her words because if she inflames Wendy, then Wendy holds the keys to the boys. We can say whatever we want. Imagine if you're Ruth and you have to bite your tongue at every turn, knowing that that family was responsible for killing your son. It, it's such a shame. She can't say what she's feeling. One can only imagine um, what her true feelings are, but she just can't articulate them. That's a great point. Uh, by the way, tell your son he lives in Manhattan and he needs to be a Giants fan, not a Patriots fan, if he's got any you, sense. But. You can respond to that if you will. The Giants kind of suck. Okay. That's, <laughs> this is a uh, PG show. So. I know my uh, my hook sot now to get everyone in right there. Andy School writes, thank you, Carl. No better time to thank Carl. We'll do one more point after this. Couldn't agree more. Uh, we need to go forward with the Adelson women's indictments. Meanwhile, uh, those boys are being withheld from Dan's parents, that part of their Jewish heritage. Such a big deal. Uh, that is a shame. And shout out here to Buttercup. Love the name. Yay, I got you live. Hi to you all from Canada. Absolutely love STS. The Markells are from Canada. I'm a big fan of all Canadians. I love every single Canadian. It's a, it's a cool country and a great place. Um, final point for today, Carl, um, as we wind through this list. Right. So for 51, given the fact that there's no doubt from anybody's following the case with any um, 
degree of uh, time. If you've seen the Dolce Vita tape, it removes all doubt of the involvement and planning and orchestration of Charlie, right? So if Charlie is a given, he's guilty, no doubt. That begs a question. What uncle would kill their nephew's dad without consulting their sister first? Sister would be the prime suspect because we know historically all murders in this type of situation, the number one suspect is the par other parent. Also, you're going to make news headlines. This is not some drive-by gang shooting in the middle of some city that is very frequent and they don't make the headlines. No, what do we have here? We have a very highly successful law professor from FSU, known internationally for his outstanding uh, legal acumen, and he's gunned down in his own garage. So why would someone loyal to Wendy, or in this case, a, a sister, do that on her behalf without her approval when the son's lives are forever traumatized? So the more you stop to think about that, you more you'll see how all these indicators definitely tie back to Wendy. Uh, John, anything to respond to with that point? Uh, it, it's, it's incredibly difficult to believe for even a moment that the murder would have been uh, planned and carried out without the knowledge of Wendy. Um, uh, there, there's no question about that. That's a great point and a very commonsensical point that the prosecution can raise to the jury. And, and lots of these things, you know, may not um, constitute direct evidence, but they may indeed resonate with the jury because you never leave your common sense at the door as a juror. You always bring it to the deliberations. And it, it's just a, it's a wonderful commonsensical argument that can be used by the prosecution if and when they get to Wendy. Uh, Riley Fox says, uh, Carl, is Carl saying that Wendy was jealous of her husband? I think uh, Riley's referring to the uh, um, being a, a professor at FSU. Is, is that basically what you were saying and implying? Yes, and I also think that she had jealousy about how Dan was successful moving on with his life. He was able to win the custody motion that she was so desperately seeking to get full custody away from Dan after they agreed to 50-50 split. So, and if you also look at the uh, interview she had with Detective Isom, she's pointing um, out that Dan had this girlfriend that was an NYU law professor up there, and she even mentions her middle initial, and she says you can go to her law firm website and study her. So there was also indications from other witnesses that were interviewed. I can't recall their names off the top of the head, but I remember seeing that in the police report that, that basically Wendy was jealous of this highly successful tenured, I repeat, tenured law professor from NYU, another highly esteemed law school. So Wendy just being an adjunct professor, I mean, and also the fact that the kids loved um, this new girlfriend in Dan's life that looked like they were going to be a long-term relationship and possible marriage. So she had n really nothing going for at that point. She's stuck in this uh, Tallahassee that she hates so desperately and is wanting to get out of there. And Dan is all set up for success brilliantly. So yeah, I, I think there was jealousy there. Uh, good and fair point. Uh, tech class hero, back to you, Carl, and then we'll wrap this up. Uh, what does Carl feel the most damning single piece of evidence is against Wendy? And then a possible defense to that from John. Well, I think it's sort of like 1A and 1B. And John's already mentioned the one, which is her asking Jeff about, is he going to be around Friday? I mean, that's just, that's just so damning. I mean, that alone, if you bring up just that alone, I mean, to I think a lot of jurors would just see from the way everything went down that that alone would be enough of a gold nugget to can show to show the conspiracy and to actually show her as a co-principal and meaning she was just as guilty of the actual tr trigger puller right so um i think the other one b part of it and and maybe there's a little bit more of an indicator of guilt is she's actually at the crime scene she actually does a murdo here she's actually at the crime scene not right before it happens but really soon afterwards and so showing up at the crime scene um, and the odds of that happening and driving totally out of your way when well, there's all kinds of liquor stores where you're supposed to meet your, your two friends for lunch and you're going to drive all the way down towards uh, uh, closer to the downtown of Tallahassee. It just was so evident that she was wanting to find out and, and, 
and finally see if the, the hit that they've been planning for so long had taken effect because they weren't getting any feedback from the hitman or from Katie. She was getting frustrated. She probably thought they had another screw up, just like the, the earlier trip that, that turned out to be fruitless because they couldn't find Dan. So there was more planning, more effort, and Dan was about to leave, and she couldn't just wait to see what actually happened there on Trescott. And that's why she lied also on their um, – on the first trial that she never drove down Trescott. And that's another reason, see, that won't come out as evidence unless you charge her with perjury. So that's why it's very important. Um, if I was a prosecutor in Texas, I would charge her with perjury both for both trials. And that way you get in all that evidence. Carl does not mess around. Uh, Lisa, thank you so much for the super sticker. And she goes on to say, best show around with the greatest guests. And now you know why you've uh, seen Carl Steinbeck and John Singer in action. Hi from Arkansas. Uh, for those of you who do not know, John Singer is a co-founder of Singer Deutsch LLP, a graduate of Georgetown Law School, a super lawyer for 1,053 years. Uh, he's a legal analyst for CNBC, and he also has uh, the best bar going in Manhattan. And uh, <laughs> we're going to have to do a live Surviving the Survivor from John's bar one day. Um, <laughs> we'll have to do that. But, John, any uh, closing thoughts on this final uh, day as we continue uh, to go through this list here? I think we're past 50 now, right, Carl? We're at right. what? 50? We'll pick back up at like 52 53? Um, we are on, we just finished 51. 51. We'll start right. back on 52 on the road to 125 and growing. So, John, final thoughts. I, I just had a question for Carl. Um, Carl, do, do you recall from, because it, it's been, it just hit me recently and I, I want to know what you thought. In the last trial, um, the second trial, when DeCoast was grilling Wendy, um, he asked her whether or not she spoke or was speaking to Rob Adelson, the, the older brother, and she said no. And they asked, and then DeCosta asked, did it have anything to do with the fact that your parents had intervened um, in Rob's relationship that, that you know, he, he's in now to his wife. Um, they had broken up that relationship. He broke up with her and then married her. And she said it had nothing to do with that. There was this beautiful reconciliation. I think the reason why they don't speak to, to Rob is because on the Matt Share Over My Dead Body Wondery podcast, he basically said he thinks they did it. So uh, I'm wondering why did DeCoast not ask her why you don't speak and why your family doesn't speak to Rob? Because I think she would have had to have admitted that the reason they don't speak is because Rob thinks that they all did it. And I think that's something they probably would want to have heard. And, and Georgia wasn't going to object to that question. That's the reason they don't speak to Rob. It's clear as day. He, he went on that podcast. His nickname was Honest Abe, they called him. And he basically said, I know what happened here. That's why they don't speak to him. Well, why that's, did a, Coast that's an did, interesting point. Why did Ducos not push her on that? Why do you think he didn't ask her that? I There's a lot of stuff when I looked at uh, that cross-examination. I thought he had... A good tone of voice. He's he's going after her with direct, sharp, pointed questions. But when she did all this deflecting, he didn't do follow up. So that's just one of the many times I was thinking, because like, wow, you missed you missed closing in on her because somebody like Wendy, they're so used to giving glib, flat, fast deflection answers like she did with Detective Isom, and and people just took it for what it is and they don't do follow up. And that's why it's very important as as a trial lawyer, you got to be able to go after and know your facts, your case so well that you can, somebody like that, you can go after them on cross-examination without having to look at notes. You got to know the facts and details of the case better than, than the defendant or a star witness. So they can't weasel out and, and deflect out. And because, because she would have really wilted on the stand if he would have followed up with every single lie that she said. I mean, she was he didn't do it. She just let, he left her hanging and would go on to the next point. So it, what I see happening that a lot with inexperienced uh, attorneys is that they're so in their mind focused on doing the script of cross-examination that there's a huge dagger thing that you just opened up something that, that they're trying to do deflection on. And so if they deflect, you do a deep dive. And so if you don't do the deep dive because you're so much in your mind following, trying to follow your script, 
you will really lose valuable cross-examination points. And that, that came up a lot in the Alec Murdoch trial. Obviously, the state prevailed in that case. But it's interesting to hear two lawyers talking about that because, uh, you know, it happens to news reporters. They get uh, hung up on the script or what they think they're supposed to right. say, and they miss important pieces of information. By the way, one of the OGs uh, when it comes, comes to the Dan Markell case mm. is in the house, Fancy Fiction. And uh, lest anyone thinks we are not a global show, Stuti is here from <laughs> Nepal. So what's going on, Stuti? Nice to have you. Hope you come back. Um, for those who do not know, he is Lieutenant Cur uh, Colonel, retired Carl Steinbeck, a 30-year uh, JAG, a judge advocate for the U.S. Army. He has his own law firm now, uh, the Steinbeck Law Firm, and he hosts his own YouTube channel called jury trial mentor jury trial mentor with his brother john steinbeck uh your final thoughts uh today carl well i'm just glad that you're having us on here joel because this is a cause for justice and um how this was brought to me from my brother john of course we've talked about that but the the tragedies for all the markels involved in this the denial of justice the delay of justice um, I, I think all this conversation we're having, I think, is going to help and encourage folks that are uh, on the prosecution side to realize they do have a case against Wendy and Donna and um, probably Harvey, too. And if you keep in mind the fact that Wendy, with the previous uh, elected prosecutor for Tallahassee, Mr. Meggs, he had no inclination to charge any of the Adelsons. He was wanting more evidence. But more evidence did come to light eventually in the terms of the enhanced videotape. And with the new state attorney, Jack Campbell, I believe the fact that he's allowed Georgia to call now Wendy a unindicted co-conspirator shows that they're really making good traction and they're headed this, this prosecution train down the right tracks. It's just a matter of when. And I think that they are building more and more confidence to go forward. And so we will see convictions for these other Adelsons. It's just taken a little bit longer than I, than I would like to see, but it will happen. And rest assured, Charlie's spent his 30, 365th day now behind bars. Doesn't really matter so much when he actually has a conviction. So I would just say, be rest assured, he's never going to be walking out and, and get out of the jail or get out of the prison. He's going to be behind bars the rest of his life. So I think that's something that those are frustrated uh, with the delays. Just keep in mind that justice is going to happen sooner or later. He already is, has all these limitations of freedom, and it's completely miserable being in jail. There's different pros and cons of being in jail versus prison. So while he's awaiting this long time in jail, um, he, it, is, it is very difficult and extremely hard mentally to have to sit in prison. And he's completely not in his element. He's around with people from my experience in being around jails anywhere from Europe to uh, Cuba to the United States. And they're all miserable places to be. And he's around those that have been in and out of there quite a few times. It's a very noisy place. It's a dark place. It's a cold place. You don't get good sleep. You don't get good food. So he's already being punished in, in, in very significant ways. Not as much as obviously a conviction and the satisfaction that would bring to all the victims and those that are following this case and looking for justice. But, um, in any event, justice will not be denied for the Markels and for Dan. And, um, and I, I believe that we'll see that here in the coming uh, months, if not years, for the rest of the Adelsons. Very well said, Carl. And uh, justice uh, hopefully will prevail in this case. And Vroom, speaking of uh, just hearing Carl's description of jail and prison, um, this question, just to throw this out there, do any panelists think it's possible Wendy could just hop to a non extradition country like indonesia john i think there's any chance you would ever do that no. after hearing carl's description i'd be there uh, on the next flight but you don't think so <laughs> no no i think she's living her life and i think she's a compartmentalizer and i think she's so haughty and believes somehow that they're never going to get to her um either that or she's the greatest actress in the entire world because when she's in that witness stand she looks like she doesn't have a care in the world she's laughing She's breezy. She's challenging the prosecutors to go after her. She's lying with impunity. I, I don't believe for a second she's going to be fleeing the country. 
Uh, KCL, there's good evidence that Wendy was involved. It's not devoid of evidence or or juvenile, followed by Katie, cool lady. It's not about hate. It's about motive, planning, and opportunity. Uh, speaking of opportunity, there's a good opportunity to get back and watch Surviving the Survivor Friday, 12.30 p.m. Eastern time. Hey, what's up, little <laughs> pupster? What's this guy's name? That's um, Laika. Laika? How old is Laika? Uh, she's about nine. Wow. She's a, a golden yeah. retriever, I think. Yeah, she's a pretty little girl. She reminds me of my Mabel Rose. May Mabel rest in peace. Um, 12.30 p.m. Nice Eastern time tomorrow. Great Scott. It's your true crime, Phil. Uh, we're going to be live at 12.30 p.m. Eastern time. 7 p.m. Sunday night, Eastern, live. Carm will be on the case. We are working to do a story uh, a show, I should say, about the Lyle and Eric Menendez case. Uh, it is a wild case that has gone on for, I think, over 30 years now. John and I were figuring this out before yep. we went on. Um, little Joel Factoid, I grew up. I knew those guys from New Jersey, and uh, we are working. There's some news in that case, believe it or not, all these years later. Uh, so we are working to... Uh, do a show on Lyle and Eric Menendez Sunday night. And don't forget, we started with dogs barking. <laughs> no dogs barking now, but uh, that cute little golden retriever is there. We had a landscaper. We had dogs barking. We had my kids come home. We had John Singer's child. I need my studio. I'm working to get it going. And the Love sirens. <laughs> sirens, too. That's New York City. Love Thank you, America. You. Love you, Texas. Love you, New York City.